Welcome, and thank you for joining us for another online program from the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Antigone Ladd, and I'm proud to be a board member here. I started by doing research here, joining hundreds of people who come in every year. Thousands of people now watch our online programs, and we are home to over a million irreplaceable historical items. If you like our programs, I hope you will consider making a donation in the simple way of hitting the red button at the bottom of your screen, which is safe and secure, and help us keep the artifacts safe and keep the programs coming. Now let me introduce our speaker for this evening. If you live in Adams County, you probably already know Dr. Ronald Crablin. He's been in practice here for 39 years. He's an innovator. He's the man who began the cardiology unit at the hospital. He was responsible for working with a team to put together the building that adjoins the hospital, the medical center building, now called the Wellspan Medical Center. He has brought needed services to this community again and again. When he retired in 2015, Dr. Craven decided to turn to writing. And he's, his first project was the history, the 100 year anniversary of Gettysburg Hospital. I know he's going to mention it a little bit this evening, but primarily his program this evening will be on the pandemic of 1918 and how it led to the creation of Gettysburg Hospital. I have talked him into doing a separate program for us just on the book and the 100 year history of the hospital, which is fascinating. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Ronald Crablin. Thank you for coming. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our presentation. We appreciate the opportunity to tell you this important story of the development of the Gettysburg Hospital at the time of an influenza pandemic. This program is about the Spanish flu and how it helped lead to the creation of the Gettysburg Hospital. From the time of the hospital's opening, it was known as the Annie M. Warner Hospital, named after the wife of its founder, John M. Warner. In 1982, it was renamed the Gettysburg Hospital. A future program will go over the development of the hospital after its establishment, based on the book, Gettysburg Hospital, 100 Years of Community Service, 1920-2020, which was edited by Roseanne McGlade, RN, Antigone Ladd, and myself, the cover is shown here. For perspective, let's look at the current hospital. This is the present Gettysburg Hospital, which is located on the same site as the original hospital, which was built in 1920. It is now a sprawling building complex. Now, let's step back in time to see what Gettysburg looked like before the hospital was built. This is a late 19th century view of the square facing south. The hospital was eventually established a few blocks down Baltimore Street and over to the right. Gettysburg is a small town, officially established in 1806. It grew slowly but prospered and became the county seat of Adams County, itself a new county separating from York County in 1800. The Civil War came to Gettysburg in 1863 and changed the town forever. It also established a tradition of civilian involvement that is still part of our heritage. The residents in 1863 had to help deal with the overwhelming deaths and injuries following the battle. Perhaps this set the stage for the community spirit that would carry them through the next great medical tragedy, the Spanish Flu. That community spirit, I'm proud to say, continues today. Here is a view of another famous Gettysburg site from the World War I era, Camp Colt. It was originally built as a military base. Then Camp Colt in Gettysburg became a specialized tank training base in 1917. Thousands of troops came here to learn about the new military weapon, the tank, and then were sent to Europe to fight in World War I. This movement of troops was a mass migration of men, but also 
of disease, and we will learn that in this program. Camp Colt was led by this young army captain in his first command. Later, of course, he became known to all of us as a general and then President Dwight D. Eisenhower. On an interesting note, most of the soldiers at Camp Colt were trained without having actual tanks available, since any tanks coming out of the factories were immediately sent to France. Eisenhower had to improvise, using trucks with guns mounted on the back and riding over the rough ground of Pickett's Charge to simulate the movement of tanks. In this way, young Captain Eisenhower trained 10,000 soldiers who were shipped overseas to fight in World War I. This was the mass migration of men. In 1919, after the war and the pandemic, Gettysburg remained the same little town, even if its citizens were changed by so much history. Its population was then 4,500. This is a view facing east down York Street. Medical facilities in Gettysburg consisted of a number of doctor's offices and small clinics, but no hospital, and there were no ambulances available. This map shows the location of the nearest hospitals, although near is not the right term. The closest was Chambersburg Hospital, 25 miles away, but it was over a mountain. York Hospital was 33 miles away, and that was quite a trip. And Harrisburg Hospital was even farther, at 41 miles away. To give you an idea of travel times, York Hospital today is about 50 minutes away on paved roads. How long would that have taken in the 1900s with poor roads and subject to the weather? It is an understatement to say that was difficult. This picture is a 1920 pickup truck, then the closest vehicle that could be an ambulance. As an example of the difficulty of transport to a hospital, consider the case of a Gettysburg College coach who broke his leg. He was initially taken care of at home. A carpenter made a traction set up for his bed in his home, and a local physician used a portable x-ray machine to follow his injury. Eventually, the coach needed hospital care. So they loaded him onto the back of a pickup truck, like this one, to make the transport to York Hospital. However, it started to rain, so with no other choice, they had to cover him over with a tarp. Imagine what that ride was like. The Spanish influenza came to Gettysburg in 1918, starting at the World War I training camp, Camp Colt, and spreading through the town. It quickly spread, leading to 160 deaths at Camp Colt and over 100 in Gettysburg. Scenes like this one at a military base were everywhere, as the Spanish flu spread around the world. As a physician, I was fascinated by the nature and history of the Spanish flu and wanted to know more about it and how it was similar to today's COVID-19 virus. So I did some research on pandemics from the past, and then zeroed in on viral influenza in particular. These slides show the major outbreaks of disease over the world, starting in the year 3000 BC. Many more outbreaks occurred, but they were local and not true pandemics. But they were truly deadly. All of these diseases had little treatment, and at those times, no known causes. Patients either died or recovered on their own. As you look at the names, you may note that all the outbreaks were not viral, but often bacterial. For instance, the plagues listed here were caused by bacteria called Yersinia. Some more recent outbreaks were of viral origin, but not specifically influenza viruses. For instance, AIDS is caused by HIV, human immunodeficiency virus and spread from chimpanzees. And Zika, which is from yet another virus family, is spread by mosquitoes. It is most known for the development of microencephalopathy in newborns of infected mothers. Narrowing down to influenza viruses, 
In the past 100 years, there have been five major pandemics. None produced disease and death like the Spanish flu. It was by far the widest spread and the most deadly. COVID-19, whose path is still unfolding, is less deadly so far. This is an electron microscopic view of the actual virus that caused the Spanish flu. These particles are extremely small, less than one hundredth microns in size, which is less than a millionth of an inch. In comparison, a human hair is about a hundred microns, ten thousand times as large in size. The virus particles cannot be seen even with a regular lab microscope and require an electron microscope. A flu particle is a relatively simple structure. It is not alive and thus cannot reproduce on its own. It only has a few parts. There are surface proteins, a capsule, and genetic material inside. It is interesting to note that the capsule is made up of lipid, therefore hand washing with soap or using sanitizers destroys it. To reproduce, the virus particles attach to the host cell, usually one of our lung cells. It breaks into it and releases its RNA nuclear code, which instructs our cells' own systems to make more virus parts. It forms a new particle, and then the particle breaks out. But it does not stop there, and keeps repeating this sequence, and can force replication of many new particles, as many as 50, which then spread to other host cells sometimes very rapidly. It can cause inflammation and destruction of lung cells in as little as 24 hours, which is exceedingly frightening. Where in the world the Spanish flu virus first began is not definitely known, but one prevailing view was at Fort Funston in Kansas, probably a mutation from a bird, then to pigs, then us allowing human-to-human -human spread from airborne particles. It was called the Spanish flu, but not because it started in Spain. Most countries had withheld reporting pandemic news in the press so as not to interfere with the war effort or lead to any panic or any shift in public attention. Spain, however, was neutral in the war, and the Spanish press widely reported the flu outbreak. Thus, the worldwide flu pandemic became labeled incorrectly as the Spanish flu. This hesitation in reporting prevented many early measures that could have combated the pandemic. For comparison, COVID-19 is also a coronavirus, but it is a less virulent strain at this time. This slide shows how it gets its name. Ron, this is Antigone. I have a question. How does COVID-19 compare to the Spanish flu based on what you've been describing so far? You used the term at this time when you talked about the less virulent strain type of COVID-19. Are you implying that something in COVID-19 could still change? Uh, well, so far, COVID-19 has been less virulent than the Spanish flu which mutated to a much more dangerous virus. COVID also mutates and has already done so several times, although these represented minor changes which have made little difference in its behavior. However, mutating to a much more infectious and deadly strain is possible as happened in 1919. We hope that will not happen before vaccines are developed. Now I will digress a bit to tell you how microbiologists learn just what the Spanish flu was made up of. It is a fascinating story of a persistent scientist and efforts of the CDC. Pictured is Johan Holten, who was a microbiologist PhD student at the University of Iowa. He learned of the difficulty of studying that virus as there were no samples available. Back in 1919, the ability to save and identify a virus did not exist. He decided to try to get a sample. By the way, of interest, in this photograph, he is pipetting by sucking up a liquid to transfer it. That is a very dangerous action. 
Today machines do this, not allowing the substance to get in your mouth. Holton identified a small town in Alaska where of the 80 residents, 74 died of the flu. They were buried in a mass grave. That part of our country is in permafrost and thus the bodies had been frozen underground since 1918. Holton traveled to Alaska in 1951 and excavated the grave with permission and took samples of several lungs. But he had trouble keeping them frozen, even trying to use CO2 from a fire extinguisher as a coolant on the way home. He sent the samples to a lab, but they could not extract any intact virus particles. Forty-six years later, then Dr. Holton learned that another scientist was using the newest methods to try to determine the genetic makeup of the Spanish flu virus. So at age 72, he went back to the gravesite and dug further, finding an attacked body of a young woman, and he took out the lung. This time the virus was isolated and its genome was identified. It is actually quite small and has only eight genes. We have 50,000. Studies were completed learning its composition and how it operates. The virus itself was actually grown in the lab. That required extensive CDC cautionary efforts, but it never escaped. Studies showed it attacked only respiratory lung cells, no other organs. But with overwhelming inflammation and fluid formation, it was a killer. Remember, no respiratory support or treatment was available at that time. The Spanish flu had three waves of spread. The first was mild, similar to seasonal flu, and did lead to some complacency. However, the virus then mutated into a much more virulent form, and the resulting second wave was catastrophic. It had much more rapid spread and severe disease development. Some patients died in only 24 hours. The third wave was more mild and spread less as the war was winding down. Ron, one more question here. How did the Spanish flu finally end? Well, it petered out, probably because of less travel and possibly to some degree of herd immunity. That term means that a good percentage of the world's population either had the flu and recovered or died from it. It is estimated that for COVID-19, a 50 to 80 percent infection rate would be required to produce herd immunity. That's a scary thought. The totals were at least 50 million deaths and 500 million cases of the Spanish flu. No accurate records were kept, so totals may have even been higher, possibly even 1 billion. The world population at that time was 1.6 billion, which meant about 56 percent had infection and thus possibly developed a herd immunity status. As a contrast today, the world would need to reach over 4 billion cases to reach that rate. Preposterous, although a vaccine could help reach that number, if it was accepted. Uh, surveys today suggest that 50% of our population would not even accept vaccination. As a physician, I view this as foolhardy. Spread was particularly increased by troop movements. Look at this crowded ship. Soldiers traveled extensively, particularly to Europe, in large numbers with no precautions. This photo was of the Liberty Parade celebration in Philadelphia in September of 1918. 200,000 were in attendance, all packed together. It was followed by a very large flu outbreak rapidly developing. In one week, 47,000 were infected and 4,000 died. Eventually, Philadelphia had over 17,000 deaths. In four days, all Philadelphia hospital beds were full and porches had to be used. Then tents were needed outside as the numbers overwhelmed the facilities. 
The bodies piled up and coffins were scarce. Many bodies were just stacked up. Cities responded differently, just as they have today. One example, New York City did not prepare at first, and thus a big spike occurred, and then leveled off with better control measures in place. St. Louis initially did better, but then relaxed too soon, and another spike occurred. Isn't this all too familiar a story today? Perhaps history does repeat itself. Effective treatment was essentially non-existent. Unproven medicines were given anyway. Many were tried. As an example, consider aspirin, which was introduced in 1899 and was considered a great medicine. It was pushed heavily by Bayer for acute treatment in spite of no clear evidence it was effective. And actually, there was no way to tell. They did not do any studies or testing. It was prescribed in doses far exceeding safety. Up to 30 grams were sometimes given daily. And the standard size tablet today is 325 milligrams. Thus, 30 grams is greater than 90 tablets. Toxicity is now considered possible with greater than 12 tablets in a day. The dose given caused pulmonary edema in greater than 30% of people, leading to death. But this complication was then often blamed on the virus itself. These four treatments are regularly used today. Uh, first is ICU, which weren't available then. Second, we have ventilators, and they were not available then. Third is medications, like this vial of rendesivir, which is antiviral. And last is convalescent plasma infusions, which have helped and certainly weren't available at that time. So the death toll was extremely high with 10% of infections leading to death, a very high rate. COVID-19 rate is much less, currently officially 3%, but it's recognized that many mild cases have not been counted. The seasonal flu death rate is less than 1%. Now let's go back to Adams County and see what the Spanish flu caused here. While the flu began at Camp Colt, the facilities were quickly overwhelmed there was no hospital in town to care for the sick. Camp Colt did have an infirmary, but it was being dismantled as the camp was closing with the end of the war. A number of the patients ended up in Gettysburg, wherever space was available, often not very pleasant. The local citizens helped care for the afflicted as well they could. This was difficult with no facilities available. Drastic measures were then suggested and were not much help. These are nurses wearing World War I gas masks. Actually, they were very effective, but did not allow much work to get done. Can you imagine your reaction if one of the nurses came to your bedside? They did have cloth masks, but no face shields, no gowns, and no gloves. A number of the caregivers died as a result. Here's a picture of nurses going to pick up uh, more bodies. In Gettysburg at that time, a local Gettysburg businessman, John M. Warner, shown here with his wife, Annie, had been discussing the need for a hospital for many years. After the Spanish flu killed more than 160 soldiers from Camp Cote, as well as over 100 local citizens, Warner decided to take action. His wife, Annie, had been one of those struck by the flu, and Warner vowed that if his wife survived he would build a hospital and name it for her. And if she did not survive, he would call the institution a memorial to her. Warner decided to donate land and a building for the hospital. He owned a parcel of land just a few blocks south of the square in Gettysburg. Here's a map showing the site of the original parcel of land. This area of the small town was undeveloped but close to the town center. This is the original deed for the first six acres of land he sold to Gettysburg for one dollar. To ensure that the hospital had room to grow, Warner, a little later, sold the hospital an additional 13 acres of land that he had previously leased to the government for the creation of Camp Colt. 
He felt the site needed enough space to be shielded from commercial development on Steinware Avenue. He was obviously a forward-thinking man. Groundbreaking was on March 25, 1919. The hospital building was completed in November of 1920 and the first patient admitted in March of 1921. Opening for patient care was held up due to the lack of nurses. Many nurses had been called away to serve in World War I at military facilities and there were not enough to staff the hospital. The hospital later built a residence to house nurses and give them easy access to the main building. This was the original building. It was constructed of brick, with two stories and a basement, though most of the basement was above ground. The first floor would provide two wards, one each for women and one for men, an isolation ward, nurses' rooms, and offices. The upper floor had maternity, a few private rooms, a sun parlor, an operating room, and doctor's rooms. The basement housed x-ray, laundry, laboratory, kitchen, and other support areas, plus storage. The hospital was also equipped with an elevator. Here is a view of the back of the hospital, which is seldom seen. From the rear, the porch section is visible. It was then quite a modern structure. The community was very proud of it. The development of the hospital enjoyed wonderful community support from many groups. This included nurses, the hospital auxiliary, physicians and the medical society, town officials and clergy, and Gettysburg and county residents. This picture shows the nurses' home built next to the hospital as a residence for the nurses. The nurses worked 12-hour shifts. Initially, there were five physicians, one for the male ward, one for the female ward, day and night shifts, and then one for surgery, delivery, and the nursery. The hospital auxiliary was formed in 1920, uh, months before the hospital actually opened. The members were exceedingly energetic, donating a wide range of supplies, fully equipping the kitchen, and often making needle items by themselves. For instance, they made 1,814 articles of linen before the opening day. This service continued for many years. Pictured as the original auxiliary president, Mrs. Clyde Stover, at a building dedication. The other photo shows the original auxiliary thrift shop, later developed on York Street. Today's auxiliary thrift shop is in downtown Gettysburg on the main square. This photo shows the physicians at work in the operating room. They were essential to the hospital's success, and nearly every physician in the county joined the hospital staff. They also contributed equipment to the hospital. One of the donors was Dr. J. McCree Dixon, who personally purchased all the surgical equipment and established a $3,000 endowment for future surgical needs. This is an example of the community pride in the new hospital. These are photos of Dr. Chester G. Christ, one of the early physicians and surgeons. Like many physicians in those times, he wore many hats. He was the coroner for 34 years, chief of the state tuberculosis clinic, medical director of Gettysburg College, and the Lutheran Seminary. He also was physician for the Adams County Jail, and the almshouse, and had a private practice in Gettysburg. He is but one example of the early physicians at the hospital. They all supported the hospital and worked there, including seeing charity patients. All patients were welcome. Note that they immediately started doing surgical cases. Then, think about where surgery was performed before the hospital was built. I like this informal shot of Dr. Chris after surgery and enjoying a coke, or at least that was what was described uh, to be in the glass. Thanks to doctors like Dr. Christ and Dr. Dixon, the original Annie M. Warner Hospital was a first-class operation from the days it opened. The citizens of Adams County have dedicated their energies as well to tackling the challenges from flu pandemic to flu pandemic over 100 years. The future goal is to continue that dedication and that effort into another century. 
We hope you enjoyed this program and learned a little bit about the Spanish flu and the creation of the Gettysburg Hospital. Ron, I can't let you get away without sharing a little bit more about your book. I know you're planning a full program on the hospital's history, but could you share a little bit right now about why you even tackled this project? Well, the history of the Gettysburg Hospital was not well recorded anywhere. So together, Roseanne McGlade, Antigone, and I put together a book telling the story of its creation and its development over the last 100 years. We included recollections of many that discuss the different aspects of their experiences at the hospital. The book will be available through the hospital gift shop. Well, on that positive note, I think we can wrap up our program and give a big thanks to Dr. Ronald Craven for a well-researched and interesting topic. We look forward to your next program, Ron, on the history of the Gettysburg Hospital. And I thank all of you who are watching this program. If you like our programs and want to help us continue them, we would appreciate any donation, which you can make easily by hitting the Donate button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much.